Thank you very much. It's a great honor for me uh, to give this class here. I remember when I was studying just on the other side here in high school and I was living in Rue Galande, so I was passing in front of Collège de France every single day. And that's basically, I mean, my grandfather was mostly proud about that. He didn't care about the fact that I was studying there. He was, I mean, proud of the fact that I was passing in front of here. So I'm very happy to be here. And um, so my class will be on, on uh, lattice spin models, which, which is one of the main object of interest in uh, statistical physics. But I will focus on one aspect of the theory. It's a very wide theory, many different ways of uh, attacking it. So I will, uh, I will focus on what we call geometric representations of this uh, lattice spin model. So it's a very probabilistic point of view on the models. And uh, I want to tell you a little bit about it. So it's even just restricting to that, it's a little bit too wide. There are many, many ways also for geometric representation, many theories that have been developed. So what I chose to do is somehow to um, give you a, a few results, which are more, th there is some kind of unity in, uh, in, in what I want to present, but I want to illustrate the fact that somehow, depending on the problem you want to solve, you want to choose the right geometric representation. And then once you have chosen the right geometric representation, very often, uh, the tools that you have to uh, invoke to study this geometric representation, they come from other fields. So you will see we are going to use discrete um, uh, complex analysis, we are going to use combinatorics, mathematical physics, I mean analysis, uh, different type of things, algebra even at some point. So I want to illustrate this fact that somehow, I mean, behind this, this few worlds, there are many different aspects of mathematics that enter into the game, and that's what makes this theory beautiful. So I hope I will manage to, to show to you that there are beautiful proofs there and that there are beautiful ideas there. Okay, so the, the class will be organized. We have eight hours, so by the way, it's really, we have time, I have time to answer questions, so interrupt if you get lost, or if you want more details about something, I would be very glad to, uh, um, to provide uh, more uh, information. So the class will start uh, today. What I want to do is basically start by telling you what is a lattice spin model, because not everybody is familiar with it, and try to, so there is some formalism that I would describe, quickly, of course, because that's not the main object somehow of the, of the course. Um, so I want to describe this formalism, give you a few examples, and then make a big table with, with basically the main results and the main open question in the field. And this should serve as both an introduction and a motivation for what we are going to do next. Then. I will tell you quickly what I will call a geometric representation. It's not, it's kind of a vague concept, but I, I think it's, it has some interest. And, uh, and you will see it's related to what we call percolation models. And percolation models in general, when they have dependencies, they are very difficult to study. So what, we, what I will start by is just study the simplest of percolation model. It's not a geometric representation of any useful lattice spin model, but it is the simplest percolation model and it's Bernoulli percolation. And for those who already had a class on Bernoulli percolation, don't worry, there will be new stuff in it. In particular, a new proof of exponential decay for percolation, which is very short and I think very neat. So, so I will, uh, I I will uh, do that, I hope, today. That will be the end of the class today. Um, then, I will start with really geometric representation. So I will introduce what we call the fortune castellan percolation, which is another type of percolation, which is a geometric representation for a very famous model, which is called the POTS model. And there I will tell you, I, I mean, what we can do with this thing, and <coughs> sorry, <coughs> and, uh, and what it, uh, it implies for the POTS model. Then I will, so this will be next class. The third class will be on yet another geometric representation. So I really want to tell you that there are many of them, even for the same models, and that depending on the problem that you want to solve, one geometric representation may be better than another one. So this third representation will be the loop representation of the fortune castellan percolation. And this one will be very useful to, for instance, distinguish between 
continuous and discontinuous phase transition. So that would be the third class. And the fourth one would be on another representation for the easing model this time, which is called the random current representation. And I will also give you a few uh, application of this representation. Okay, so let me start. Ah, by the way, uh, there are lecture notes. So they are still, uh, it's still uh, a draft yet, but there are already 80 pages, so it's a <laughs> big draft. And uh, so the all the, for instance, all the references, I would just refer to the notes. I would give the names, I would not write them, and you can just find them in the notes. More details are provided in the notes. There are many proofs that I'm gonna just skip by lack of time. And also, if you think I'm writing too fast, I mean, you can just print the lecture notes and then. Okay, so first let's start with lattice spin model. So these models, they have been introduced to study, f I mean, at the beginning, um, um, uh, what's my name? To, I mean, different type of, of, uh, of models, so of, of uh, physical phenomena. This is too close now. What is this one? So, um, for instance, the first model that has been introduced and in maybe one of the only you heard about is the easing model. But lattice spin models, uh, I mean, they gather a much wider class of models, and there is a general formalism that I want to describe. So I will always be on ZD, that's why I will call a, a lattice spin model. So ZD, you know what it is, and I will, uh, the, the set of edges would be denoted by E of ZD, just the nearest, I mean, the edges between nearest neighbors. And I will often consider a uh, finite subset of ZD, and I will just denote it like that, okay? Finite graph. So, definition of the formalism. So let's new be an integer, and, um, and omega, uh, no, maybe, let's, no, new an integer, and x, Scalar y would be the sum of the xi, yi, for i equal 1 to nu. Okay? So this is a scalar product. So now the first thing is uh, spin space. What is a spin space? So the spin space is just a subset omega. I'm sorry about this. It's, I mean, I think it's too close, no? Okay. So omega would just be a subset of R nu, any subset. We are going to see many examples later, so I'm not going to spend time here. It's just a subset of R uh, nu. Now, a spin configuration is simply be an element sigma, which usually I will call sigma x for x in G, of omega to the vertices of G. So every vertex of G receives a spin, sigma x. So sigma x is a spin at x. And this spin is just taking values in some set omega, the spin space. So this is a spin configuration. I mean, kind of dual to the spin configuration, the, there is a boundary configuration. And this is going to be an element tau same thing, tau x, but this term for x in zd minus v of g. So in the complement on you of your finite graph. You have spins on your graph, and you have boundary condition on the complement. So this is in omega to the zd minus v of g. Okay, very well. I mean, this is a little bit a list of definitions so far. But don't worry, it will become more interesting later. So the Hamiltonian now, which you can also see at the, as the energy of a configuration, is defined as follows. So let's first define, uh, consider gxy. <coughs> this will be a family of what we call coupling constant. So just elements, uh, I mean, family of coupling constant. I'm not telling you if they, are, if they are equal to zero, if they are negative, positive, it's just 
any family. Just what I will assume is that it's translational invariant in the sense that g of x, y is just g of x minus y, I mean j of x minus y, okay? Invariants are the translation. Now I can define the energy of a configuration as follows. So the energy on a graph G, let's say with free boundary condition of a configuration sigma, is going to be minus the sum over x and y included in uh, G. So I will identify G and V of G. This will be simpler. Okay, so G, I mean the graph and the set of vertices uh, is identified and um, are identified. And if I speak about the set of edges, then I will say E of G. So J X Y, and here I take sigma X, sigma Y. So think of the following. If the G J X Y are positive, which would be always the case in this class, but I will talk about it later. Then what I'm saying is that the energy is smaller when spins are closer and um, are more aligned, okay? So this is a free uh, Hamiltonian, and then there is a Hamiltonian with boundary condition tau, and this is gonna be just the free one minus the sum for x in G and y not in G of Jxy the scalar product of sigma x with this time, so if I want to take something at y, so I'm going to take two tau y, okay? So this is going to be the Hamiltonian at uh, with boundary condition tau. And now that I have the Hamiltonian, I'm going to be able to define uh, the measure. So. The first measure, natural measure that I can put on spins, of configuration of spin, is the following. I could just say, okay, take d sigma zero, any measure on, okay, on omega. Take any measure on omega and take the product measure, okay? Define d sigma to be the product for x in g of d sigma x, where these are copies of d sigma zero. Okay, this is a measure where you choose independently every spin. Okay, here I didn't say it's a probability measure, but if you take a probability measure, it would exactly correspond to choosing independently every spin. Problem is that this is not extremely interesting uh, measure. Just, by the way, examples that you should think of is if omega is discrete, is a finite set, I mean, you know, discrete, then you can just take the counting measure. This is usually what we will do. I will, by the way, just refer it at CM. If omega is R, you can take, for instance, the Lebesgue measure. In general, if you take omega to be a continuous Lie group, then the R measure is in the natural field, compact continuous Lie group. So this is the product measure, not very interesting because every spin is dependent. So what I'm gonna do now is that I'm gonna twist this product measure and I'm gonna consider what we call Gibbs measures. So on a graph G at inverse temperature beta, which is going to be a positive real number, and with boundary condition tau, uh, I mean, the Gibbs measure on G at inverse temperature beta with, uh, is defined by the following formula. If I look at uh, the expectation of a function f, sorry, um, this is gonna be the ratio of two things. 
On the bottom, I'm just going to look at the integral of our omega to the g of exponential of minus beta times the Hamiltonian. OK? I just integrate the exponential of this. And at the top, I'm going to do the same, except that I also multiply it by f of sigma. So this corresponds to twisting, twisting the product measure by the energy. Okay, you are favoring configuration with um, low energy. Is it okay? So this is for every function f from uh, g. Omega G to R. <coughs> okay, so at this point, it's, I mean, I'm basically done with defining uh, the formalism. This is a typical measure we are going to look at, okay? I mean, I'm certain that most of you already encounter this type of measures, and there is no surprise there. Uh, just uh, a few remarks. Um, if j x y is larger or equal to zero for every x and y, the model is said to be ferromagnetic. So in the sense that it's favoring uh, spins that are aligned. You want to be aligned. If um, j x y Equals, zi equals zero when x, y is not an edge of z, d. So as soon as x and y are not neighbors, g, x, y equals zero. If you have this, then we say that the model is nearest neighbor. Then the model is nearest neighbor. And you see that in the case of nearest neighbors, the only uh, freedom we have is in the J of neighbors, basically. And because up to translation, uh, up to scaling, I mean, scaling by, uh, if you change all the coupling constant by, a con uh, by a, I mean, a multiplicative constant, then it only boils down to changing beta. So what I will do in this case is that I will always fix JXY to be one for the neighbors, okay? So in this case, In this case, we just fix j x one to be one. For x neighbors of y. In fact, I mean, in most of the class, I will focus on this nearest neighbor ferromagnetic model, except for the easing model, because basically the study that I'm going to do is not depending at all about the coupling constant, except at a very specific point. But you can just think of the nearest neighbor anyway. You are not going to make mistake there. So now examples. What are the typical examples of uh, lattice models? Well, the first one is the most classical one. It's the easing model. So this corresponds to taking omega to be minus 1, 1. So spins are just minus 1 or 1. You take d sigma 0 to be the counting measure. And you obtain a model, which was introduced by a lens in the 20s to study uh, ferromagnetism and to try to explain why there is a Curie temperature uh, for uh, ferromagnets. Um, so once again, the references, I just, I mean, they are all in the lecture notes, so I'm not going to write them. Another classical model that you probably heard about, it's the POTS model. So the POTS model 
correspond to taking omega to be a polyhedron, TQ. So for instance, for Q equal to, it's just going to be in dimension 1, 1 and minus 1. Q equal 3 is going to be the equilateral error and so on. So I'm, I mean, so the property of this thing is that uh, if x and y, I mean, if sigma x, sigma y are in this uh, polyhedron TQ, then I have the following property that the scalar product between the two is going to be 1 if sigma x equals sigma y and minus 1 over q minus 1 if sigma x is not equal to sigma y. Okay, so you, you notice that for q equal 2, I mean, this is indeed the thing with 1 and minus 1 and you recover the easing model. So the POTS model with two states is just the easing model. In general, it's a model with q possible spins and the important thing that basically you only care whether you are equal or different. All the spins, as soon as you take two different spins, they have the same scalar product. One minus one over Q minus one. Why am I saying that? Because there is another model with Q states, which is also very natural, which is called the clock model, which is very famous uh, as well. A little bit in the probability uh, community because this POTS model is very classical, but in this case, what you're, and here of course d sigma zero is a counting measure. Here, omega is going to be the q roots of unity. Okay, it's also a fairly natural uh, um, set with q states, and uh, d sigma zero is still the counting measure. And you notice that for q equal two and three, you recover exactly the POTS model. But for q larger or equal to 4, you get a model, there are the same number of states, but now different spins, when they are not equal, I mean, still you care whether they are close to each other or not. So a priori, the behavior is different, and you are going to see that, I mean, I'm going to illustrate the fact that it's indeed very different. Okay? Uh, I should have said that the POTS model was introduced by uh, POTS advisor, exactly like the easing model was introduced by Lenz. So easing's advisor seems to be a pattern there, and um, and Pod studied it in uh, in its um, PhD. Now let's uh, go to continuous spin. So the most classical model with continuous spin is the spin O n model, where in this case omega is just going to be the n minus one dimensional sphere, so it's a set of z in Rn, such that the L2 norm of z is equal to one. And now the d sigma zero is just gonna be the surface measure on S n minus one. So once again, for n equal one, what do we get? We get uh, the sphere in dimension one, so we get plus one minus one, we recover the easing model. So this is a generalization of the easing model. The Q state POTS model was a generalization in discrete spins. Here it's in continuum. So for n equal two, so n equal one is easing. And just for your culture, n equal two is called the XY model. It's a very classical model. Uh, in fact, introduced slightly before this one. This one was introduced by Stanley in 68. So n equal two, it's called the XY model, was introduced a few uh, years before. It's also sometimes in the, in the planar case called the planar uh, router model. Router model. Oh, well, okay. Choose the number of O's here, I don't, don't really remember. Uh, router, yeah, there is only one. There are two, but like that. And n equals three, is the classical Heisenberg model. So these are the very famous instances of, of the ON model. 
Let me mention two other models, which maybe I mean will surprise you a little bit that they fit so well in this uh, framework. So the next model is simply the discrete Gaussian free field. So the discrete Gaussian free field fits in this framework as follows. This is the fifth example. It's a discrete Gaussian free field. I will not mention it later, but I think it's interesting to see that there is no problem here. So omega is equal to r. The so spins are element of r. And d sigma 0 is just, well, the Gaussian measure. And in this context, you can, uh, you, you can define the, um, the Gibbs measure. And somehow, it will depend a little bit on beta, what is going to happen. So I mean, I think that people who saw the discrete Gaussian free never saw it introduced like that. Usually, when you look at the um, Gaussian free you have this Dirichlet energy, which is defining uh, the energy of the system. Well, you can recover that. Here, uh, here, sorry, it's the lambda sigma zero, so this is just a Lebesgue measure. Define d lambda to be the product of the d lambda sigma x for x in g. So instead of looking with respect to the product measure for d sigma, look at just the Lebesgue measure on r to the g, OK? Look at this and rewrite exactly this quantity here. Rewrite it in terms not of d sigma, but of d lambda. And what you are going to get is that when you, let's just focus on the free boundary conditions. If you look at this thing, you're going to get, let's, you are going to get this thing, integral of r to the g, of f of sigma, exponential of a certain measure uh, of a certain energy, E of uh, sigma, D lambda sigma, and same thing here, where E of sigma, I should maybe say E beta of sigma, is given by the following thing. So somehow what I'm doing here, I'm just putting I mean, writing these things in the energy, OK? So if I do that, what I will get is here, I will get, w uh, I mean, minus beta. I will get 1 half of the sum for x, y in the edges of E of g of sigma x minus sigma y squared. And now this, you recognize the Dirichlet energy. And you have an additional term, which is given by this thing, like that. So you just put this in the energy. You get this measure. So you see that if 2d beta is equal to 1, I just recover the massless Gaussian free field, so the massless GFF. If 2d beta is bigger than 1, then I will, uh, smaller than 1, sorry, then I get a massive GFF. And if 2d beta is larger or equal to 1, in this case, I get something with divergences. Yes? Uh, D. Uh, it's ZD. I mean, the, so it's the dimension of, of the space. Yes, G is a subset of ZD. Sorry, that was not clear. I mean, mu is the uh, space of, I mean, the dimension of the spin space somehow, I mean, in, in, in which omega is living. D is really the dimension of the space of, of the underlying graph. Okay. 
So just to say that you can recover the GFFs uh, like that. And let me uh, give you a, na a last example, just also for the culture, I will not use it also uh, during the, this class. And this is what we call 5, 4, D uh, lattice model. So this, is, this D is once again referring to the dimension. And in this context, omega is still equal to R, but D sigma 0 is exponential of minus A sigma 0 squared minus B sigma 0 to the 4, D lambda sigma 0. And here, I've, for this to be convergent, you want B to be positive. So what you do, you do basically the same as for the Gaussian free fit, but you add a power 4. So why is it so interesting to do that? First, I mean, a physicist would tell you that's the simplest thing to do if you don't want to have discrete Gaussian free fit. That's the simplest thing to add after, w after it. That's a good argument. Um, the other argument, I mean, be larger or equal to zero. Um, if b equals zero, this is a GFF. But if you take a to be equal to, let me just not write something stupid, uh, b equal to minus 2a, and let b tends to infinity, here you see part of uh, sigma 0 squared minus 1 squared appearing. So in this context, you will get a basically exponential of minus a sigma 0 squared minus 1 squared. So when uh, b, there is a b here, when b is going to tend to infinity, what do I get? I'm saying, I'm claiming that sigma 0 must be closer and closer to minus 1 or 1. So I recover the easing model. So this model, this 5, 4, D lattice model, is somehow an interpolation between the GFF and the easing model. And the good thing about it, I mean, this will be at some point, I will use an inequality which can look completely mysterious at first sight, where you bound uh, correlation for the easing model by correlation for the GFF, I mean, the by the green function. And this fact, in fact, is not so surprising if you think that there is a natural model interpolating between these two things. So they are basically uh, degenerate, I mean, degenerate models for uh, the same family of model. So, okay. So that was uh, what, I mean, the examples I wanted to, to uh, um, present. So particular, like that, if you s hear about this 5, 4, D, we would, you would have a, a definition at least. And not, now I want to discuss the phase transition in this model. And I'm going to do it really in, a, in the fastest way possi possible. So I'm not going not to define the whole theory. I want to go straight to the essential. So third thing, phase transition. And for simplicity, and because I'm only going to focus on this later, I'm going to look at phase transition in the pots and ON models. So I'm not going to I'm not going to discuss uh, the GFF or the 54D or even the clock model. I'm going to forget about them. Okay. So first thing. If tau x is equal to 1, and when I mean 1 here, I mean 1, uh, 0, 0, 0. So if I'm looking at uh, something in, uh, in uh, R nu, here I put nu minus 1, zeros. This thing is, I mean, I'm always going to look at this boundary condition. So what am I doing? Basically, there is in all these models, you can see that there is some intrinsic symmetry in the spin uh, space, okay? And I want to break the symmetry. So what I do, and they always contain one. So what I do is that I put boundary condition to be one everywhere outside of my graph. It um, um, polarize the measure. It tends uh, to be aligned with one, okay? So now I can measure how much, I mean, by how much the spins want to be aligned with this one. So there is a natural quantity that I can look at is called the order parameter, m beta. And it's going to be the limit when n tends to infinity of 
I'm going to look in a box of size n. So lambda n is going to be the box of size n in dimension d. I look at the average spin at zero. I look how much it's aligned with one. Okay? Is it okay for everybody? So I look at zero, it's in the middle of my box, and I look how much I'm aligned with one, which is a boundary condition. And here the limit, in fact, I'm cheating a little bit, there is no reason why there should be a limit. We are expecting there is a limit, but at this point I don't know, so I'm going to just take the limit. Like that I don't have any problems. So this is the order parameter. And basically it's saying that if this thing is positive, basically even if I send the boundary condition to infinity, I still have uh, a, break of uh, 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 yeah, a break of symmetry in my measure. At zero, I still remember that I want to be aligned with the boundary conditions. Okay? So in this context, we will say in general that you are in the ordered phase. There is another quantity that I want to define, tau of beta, which is the inverse correlation length and which is going to be defined at the limit when n tends to infinity of minus 1 over n log of the same quantity as before. Okay, so in this context, I'm looking at something different. I'm looking at the, the quantity, I mean, how much I'm aligned but I'm taking the log and I'm looking at minus one over n times this thing. So I'm looking at the rate of exponential decay of this quantity. And once again, I'm, I have no guarantee this, is, uh, this limit exists, so I'm going to take the lim inf. And basically now I'm back, I mean, I have the following picture. So first, uh, I can define the beta c tilde, below which tau of beta is positive. And I can define the beta c above which m star of beta is positive. Okay? Here I should be a little bit careful because I have no guarantee this is positive. But, well, trust me, it is. <laughs> That's here I have to cheat a little bit. So you agree I can define this beta c tilde and this beta c. And now the conjecture is that, well, in between, so you, you see that here, because tau of beta is positive, you have that this quantity decays exponentially fast, basically. Here, it doesn't decay at all. It tends to a constant. I mean, it remains bounded from below by a constant, which is strictly positive. In between, what is happening? Well, the conjecture is that it decays algebraically algebra fast. Meaning that this quantity is basically like a power, I mean decays like a power law. But this is really a conjecture, we don't know that in general. I mean everything else is just the definitions and that's what we want. So notice that a priori there are different possible scenar scenario that are uh, compatible with this picture. So the first thing is maybe beta c tilde is equal to beta c and is equal to infinity. Okay? It's possible that in fact these two things are equal to infinity. So in this context means that you always have exponential decay of correlation. You never have order but you even never have polynomial decay, you are always decaying exponentially fast. So in this case, I will say that there is no phase transition. I will give you examples afterward, don't worry. You could also have that beta c tilde is smaller than beta c, which is equal to infinity. So in this context means there is a kind of critical point, which is, I mean, before you have exponential decay, now you have polynomial decay but you never have complete ordering, okay? So in this context, we speak of uh, Berezinski. I don't want to make a mistake in 
Berezinski. Kostelitz and Thaules phase transition. So the name comes from the fact that um, this, this uh, phase transition was first non rigorously uh, uh, seen for the spin on model with n equal 2, for this xy model. So you are going to see, in fact, it's now even proved, but at the time it was non rigorously exhibited by, by these uh, three uh, authors in two independent papers. And uh, that's why the, I mean, why the name. You can also imagine that beta c tilde is equal to beta c and is finite. So that means what? That means there is exponential decay up to a certain point. And at this point, I start to have just ordering. There is no whole phase of parameter with uh, algebraic decay. Okay. So this is what we call a sharp order disorder. phase transition. And in fact, well, I mean, in this class, it will be only about this type of phase transition. And for people who did percolation theory, that's exactly the phase transition you get in this context. Not that there are two possible behavior there, is since beta c tilde equals beta c, you can wonder what is happening at this critical point. Do you have m star of beta c strictly positive or equal to zero? So if m star of beta c equals zero, then we say that the phase transition is continuous. Somehow the, the order parameter vanishes continuously up to the critical point. And if not, if this thing is strictly positive, then we say that the phase transition is discontinuous. Just one remark for culture once again, because I will not go back to this later. I mean, there, there is another possible thing. There could be that beta c tilde is strictly bigger, uh, smaller than beta c, which is strictly smaller than infinity. This a priori could be the case. It's not very, very, very simple to find models where you have this, but there is one model that uh, exhibits that. If you take the planar clock model with many, many states, Q very, very large. Then it has exactly this phase transition. And you should not be so surprised somehow. First, there are a finite ma uh, finitely many states. It's not a continuous uh, space of, uh, of spins. So in this context, if people heard already the name of Peirce argument, you can guess that with some kind of Peirce argument, you can prove that beta c is smaller than infinity. At some point, you are going to have ordering because the space of spins is, di is discrete. Now, if Q is very large, this planar clock model, what does it look like? Well, it basically looks like the XY model. The XY model, model is basically when you have continuous spin on, this, on, uh, on the circle, where here it's uh, a discrete approximation of it, but it's very close to it. And for this model, you know that you have, I mean, I didn't really, I, I just mentioned it, that that's what was expected by Berezinski, Kostelitz, and Taoles, that there is a phase transition like that. So beta c tilde will be finite. And basically, if Q is sufficiently large, the approximation that you get for beta c tilde, you can see very easily that they are very different from the estimation that you can get for beta c. And you can prove that they are basically different. Okay? So there is no reason why these three things should be the only thing that we matter, I mean, that we want to study. But somehow, for the POTS and for the ON model, indeed, it's only one of these three things that is possible. So let me now gather a little bit the different the different known results and the different things, the conjecture that are still open. And somehow you will see that it, it gives a, I mean, 
good motivations, there are beautiful problems there, and it also gathers some kind of, I mean, 40 years of, of, uh, of theory of lattice uh, spin models, and many important tools in, the, in planar statistical, I mean, in statistical physics have been introduced by trying to prove the different thing that I'm gonna mention now. So let's say that there is the Ising model, there is a POTS model, and there are gonna be Q equal to two and three states, and Q larger or equal to four states, and then there is the ON model, and there are gonna be N equal to two, and N larger or equal to three. Okay. Then they're gonna be D equal one, and this is going to look like that. Then D equal two. <laughs> and D larger or equal to three. Now this is going to look like that. Took me so long to, <laughs> to draw this thing first. Uh, okay, uh, this is going to look like that <laughs> and like that. Okay, now let's try to fill these things. So, for d equal one, and that's a s nice exercise you can give to your uh, sister and your uh, brothers, young ones, I mean, sorry, uh, my brothers are still young, so that's. <laughs> <laughs> so d equal one, uh, phase transition, no. Simply there is beta c tilde is equal to beta c is equal to infinity, no problem with that, and it's trivial to prove, basically, for all these models. Well, it's trivial. I mean, here I did like that because here as well it's true. So for n larger or equal to three, when you look at the ON model, you have uh, no phase transition, and that's not trivial to prove. In fact, it's so not trivial to prove that it's not at all proved. So it's a conjecture due, due to Polyakov, and it's a very, very important conjecture. Um, if you want, it's, it's a two-dimensional analog of young nibs. So it's, it's a very, very, very important uh, conjecture for people who already heard these kind of things. For instance, for n equals three, you want to prove there is no phase transition for the Heisenberg model, the planar Heisenberg model. And, um, Understanding this type of things is basically similar to understand Anderson localization, delocalization type uh, question. So it's extremely important. This is basically much more important that, I mean, I will mention later uh, proving continuity for, say, percolation. Or, I mean, this is a huge conjecture and there is absolutely no result there. Basically, they don't even know that for n very large, it's true, for instance, which would be something that the probabilists we expect could be done. No idea how to do that. So extremely important conjecture if you want uh, to have many prices, this is probably a good problem. There, for the Ising model, in fact, the phase transition is always gonna be continuous and sharp order disorder. It's always gonna be continuous, whatever the dimension, and sharp. So the sharpness was first proved by uh, Eisenman, Barsky, and Fernandez in 87. I'm gonna give you a proof, a recent proof, which is much, much shorter. And I think somehow it's, I mean, Michael also agrees, but uh, it's, it's, it's a better, uh, it's a shorter view of, of, of what was done. And the good advantage that it's gonna be very similar to what I'm gonna do for percolation. It's basically the same proof. So this, I will present a proof in these uh, lectures. And the continuity, well, the continuity for D equal two was known since on Zagger, so uh, 49, uh, 44 even in this context. And um, for D equal two, and I'm gonna prove again for D equal two the result in these lectures. And for D larger or equal to three, it's a recent result. It's uh, back, I mean, it's, it was last year that we proved that with Michael Eisenman and Vlada Sidoravicius. Sidora so I will also present this in these uh, lectures. So now all of this somehow is known. Now for Q equal, 
uh, three, oh, sorry, that was, that's a pity. This is five and this is three and four. For Q equals three and four, for D equal two, it's also continuous, in fact, and sharp. The sharpness was proved by Vincent Beffarin and myself uh, four years ago now. I will not prove it. And the continuity was proved last year with uh, Vlada Sidoravicius and Vincent Tassio, and this I will prove. So this will be done in this lecture as well. Now, in this context, for the POTS, so for the planar POTS model with more <coughs> than five colors, or for the, plan, uh, for the POTS model in higher dimension with more than three colors, the thing is discontinuous and sharp. Order disorder. So you see the number of colors for the POTS model really matters. I mean, you can have a discontinuous or a continuous phase transition depending on the number of colors. And uh, here, basically, the state of the art is that in, pla in the planar case, the sharpness is proved by the same reason it's also this paper with Befara and myself. The discontinuity is proved for Q larger or equal to 25 instead of 5. I will discuss with you, the I mean, I will, I will try to explain why, in fact, it's natural to expect Q equal 5. You will see it, it enters uh, naturally. And I will give you a very short proof of Q larger than uh, 3 to the power 8. But it's much shorter than... Uh <laughs> okay? And in higher dimension, sharpness is not known. We don't know that POTS model undergo uh, sharp uh, phase transition. And discontinuity is not known as well. So here I should say that the discontinuity is known also for a very large number of colors, exactly like for, uh, for D equal to, I told you, Q large or equal to 25. For D large or equal to 3, it's going to be Q sufficiently large, but it's always known. And there is even a surprising result that is saying that if you fix the number Q and you go to D sufficiently large, then you are discontinuous as well. But somehow it's still not sufficient to cover everybody. It's very strange. So, I mean, this Q large enough, the first result was due to Kotecki and Schlossmann, and this D large enough is due to uh, Chase, Biscup, and Crawford, and it's much more recent. Now here, so if I look at the XY, the planar XY model, the phase transition is a costalit taures phase transition, and this is due to Frölich and Spencer. And that's one of the main paper uh, of, of the 80s in, in all this theory because it's where they introduce uh, infrared bounds, the use of infrared bounds in the study of lattice models. And this has been since then one of the main tools in the, in, the, in the domain. So there is a costalit towerless uh, phase transition. So bear in this. And here there is a sharp order disorder phase transition and the sharpness is conjectural. And the order disorder phase transition is due to Frolich, Simon, and Spencer. So once again, there is in the lecture notes this table with all the references. I'm not going to spend too much time there. But just I want to say that the main conjecture that are remaining is definitely this is the biggest fish. There is no reason about it, uh, no, no question about it. The sharpness in general here and here would be extremely interesting try to understand why you have sharpness. And um, then understand the discontinuity fully is, is a very uh, tantalizing problem. So we somehow we understand all the continuous cases. We don't understand the discontinuous cases, which from a physics point of view is slightly surprising because usually discontinuous phase transitions are simpler to identify than continuous ones. But here uh, in this context, well, we managed to do all the others. I, I'm actually quite hopeful for this one. For the planar case, at least I see how to do. Even, I mean, I have strategy. But I understand why. Here, I'm, I'm, I'm a little bit lost. Okay, so that was uh, basically the introduction on, on uh, all these uh, lattice spin models. It's, it was a little bit vague, of course, because I'm not providing any proofs. And, I mean, the definition are not completely... Uh, uh, well defined, but but now I'm going to just change my uh, 
uh, my perspective and only look at what we call percolation models. So a percolation model in general on a graph is defined as follows. So that was five, no, that was uh, three, so four. What do I mean by percolation model? So first, a percolation configuration It's an element omega, omega e for e edges of my graph G, which is an element of 0, 1 to the edges. So that means that every edge has a value which is, it's, I mean, either omega, uh, either 1 or 0. So if omega e equal 1, we will say that the edge is open. And if omega e is equal to 0, we say that e is closed. Now that just definitions. But now the interesting thing about this is that you can see a configuration as a subgraph of the original graph G. So you can see, you can say uh, omega, it's a graph which is given by the, sum vert the same vertices as before, V of G. And the edges, you can say, OK, I look at all the edges E in E of G, such that omega E is equal to 1. I only keep the open edges. So I get a subgraph of the original graph, G. And what I want to study is basically the connectivity properties of this graph. And what I would call a percolation model is just a family of measure PG for G finite subgraph of ZD of measures on this uh, percolation configurations. Okay, so very different from spin models. Spin models, they are on, I mean, the spins are on vertices. Here I'm looking at. Um, at values on edges. So just some vocabulary. So the maximal connected components of omega, I will call them clusters. So uh, in fact, the connected components of omega I will call them clusters. Just uh, useful name. And now I'm going to say that X is connected to Y in S, okay, in a subset S of edges, or uh, of. Uh, <laughs> that was bothering you as well, no? Um, X is connected to Y in S if there is a pass of vertices in S which are connected by open edges, okay? If there is, so X is equal to V0, then there is V1, V uh, K equal uh, Y, such that VI, VI plus one, that's still bothering me, is open for every I. Okay? <laughs> okay, well, <laughs> we have to live with it, I guess. Okay? And I will say that a subset A is connected to B in S if there exists A in A, so a vertex in A, a vertex in B, such that A is connected to B in S. Okay? 
I apologize for people who already saw all this. I mean, but but I I want everybody to be able to follow, and I want that we are all together with the notations. So if s is equal to zd, I will just drop it from the notation. If there is no restriction on s on, on the subset here, I forget it. And if I write b equal infinity, what do I mean? I just mean that there is an open path going to infinity. So an infinite open path. Okay. Well, uh, we are going to do a break. Don't worry. I'm just uh, there is a natural point to stop in in uh, two minutes. So. Um, imagine for a moment that you have two models that you have a spin model and that you have a percolation model. But imagine that you have a connection between these two models that if I look at how much sigma x, I mean the spin at x and at y are aligned, imagine I can write this as a percolation on, so let's put g here, a percolation on g, that the probability that x is connected to y. You could imagine that there are two models and that they are related like that. Well, if you have a, a connection like that between the spin model and the percolation model, I would say that the percolation model is a geometric representation of uh, the lattice spin model. You see, you rephrase some very analytic quantity, which is how much uh, two spins are aligned. So in terms of percolative property, the geometric properties of your percolation uh, configuration. Okay? So this is what I will call, uh, this is <coughs> a geometric representation of uh, the spin model. And we are going to see a few examples of this during this class. And you note, I mean, of course, this has an advantage only if this percolation model is simpler to study than the original spin model. But what is going to happen is that very often we are going to be able to use inequality. So usually here what they do is that they, they actually write very precise analytic uh, quantities. And they cannot, I mean, most of the time they have hard time dealing with inequalities. When you go to this geometric, uh, more quantitative vision of the problem, there inequality correlation inequalities arise more naturally. Uh, you can do inequalities in general between different set of events and things like that, and you uh, can study the model better. So usually the geometric representation, and I really mean usually because it's not always the case, is simpler to study than uh, the lattice model itself. And that's what I will try to illustrate in the class, what I propose is the following. We do a short break, five minutes. I mean, there is an extremely natural point to stop uh, at, the, at the very end of the lecture. So maybe I will still five minutes if we are really late, but I guess it's better to do a break, a five minutes break. And then we study Bernoulli percolation, which is the simplest percolation model. Okay, five minutes. <coughs> 